Hello and welcome to Increase Effectiveness and Expand Impact by Changing Systems, an NSB webinar. My name is Jim Torrens. I'm your host and moderator today. I'm joined in our Oakland offices by our Administrative Support Manager, Esther Polk. Hi, Esther. Thank you. Hi. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, I'm going to click on... Um, we have a fantastic panel for you today, so I'm really eager to give them a chance to talk about their work on changing workforce systems, industry employment practices, and public policy that affects those two. Um, in order of their uh, speaking today, I'll introduce them. First, Scott Sheely, who's the Executive Director of the Lancaster County Workforce Investment Board in Pennsylvania. Um, and Scott is a member of NNSP's Advisory Committee. He's also a faculty member in the Sector Skills Academy, which is offered by the Aspen Institute. Um, and he works with workforce boards and their partners around the country um, on uh, implementing a sector approach. He's a frequent, frequent speaker on that. Um, and he's going to talk today specifically about the work that he's led in Lancaster to restructure one-stop operations in the sector of aid. So, Scott, thank you so much for for speaking with us today. Um, I'm also, we're also joined by Jessica Goodhart. She directs the Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy's Repower LA project, um, and working with uh, partners in the community and environmental partners and the IBEW Local 18, she has successfully advocated for more than doubling the energy efficiency budget of the LA Department of Water and Power and the launch of an innovative on-the-job training program to prepare entry-level workers, um, which we're going to hear about uh, we're going to hear about soon. So Jessica, thank you for, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Um, we also have uh, Jack Mills, who's the director of the National Network of Sector Partners here at the Insight Center for Community Economic Development. And Jack is, uh, does a lot of thinking about how sector initiatives can increase access to good jobs for low-income individuals and communities, can improve job quality, um, particularly in low-wage jobs, uh, can support job creation, and can imp increase employment equity. Um, and a lot of that work has to happen through systems change to efforts that sector initiatives are well positioned to lead. So Jack is going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of what we know from the field after we hear from the two specific examples of Scott and Jessica. So Jack, thank you for uh, for being on the webinar today. Hi, everyone. Um, next slide, please. So just uh, briefly, and you'll want to cycle through these a little bit. Um, if you haven't been on one of our webinars before, just a few technical points about how you can open and control your panel control panel by um, arrow in the upper left. If you click on that, it will disappear. And if you click on it again, it will reappear. There are two ways to listen in on this webinar. Uh, we've heard feedback that it's desirable to have an internet streaming option. I hope that's useful for you. Um, so if you can hear me, you're using one of those methods. Um, and by popular demand, um, as I mentioned, we're streaming, streaming audio for this session. We are recording the session today, so links to the slideshow recording and other materials will be sent to you after the webinar. And if you find them useful, you, you should feel free to share them with others. We do want to take your questions and comments throughout. Um, and uh, you can do that by submitting questions through, through the questions page. Just type in your question and it will be received. Um, you can also raise your hand if you have a technical difficulty or a question and I will uh, send you a message in the background to let you know that I've seen it and ask how I can help. But uh, we'll also solicit your contributions um, at different points using that questions pane, so please do, uh, please do chime in. Why should you care about systems change? I just want to offer a little bit of framing from my, from my own experience, uh, particularly managing and developing sector-focused training programs at JVS in San Francisco for several years. Um, and 
sector initiatives typically pursue systems change for two main reasons. One, to help them serve participants better, particularly to address structural barriers to serving participants. And two, to expand the impact uh, to affect people that you might not serve directly, or both. So um, very briefly, when I was at, at JVS, um, when the California Employment Development Department, or EDD, uh, issued a waiver for our back-to-work training program to allow us to integrate job search skills training into the occupational skills training um, in order to prepare these participants for uh, who are laid off garment workers for jobs, uh, new careers as environmental services workers in hospitals. That allowed us to serve them more effectively. That was a systems change. Without that systems change, we would have been hamstrung a bit in our efforts um, to serve them. Similarly, when we worked with City College of San Francisco to adopt uh, various programs that later became institutionalized, such as a refresher course for foreign trained nurses or the Gateway to Health Careers summer prep course, um, and the college actually took it into its catalog and, and paid for it with its own dollars, um, allowing us to help not just those that we previously worked with, but others um, in the community to uh, enter health careers. That was a systems change. These types of systems change are what we really uh, think that sector initiatives are well poised to make happen. This is a quote from uh, one of the seminal resources for systems, uh, for sector initiatives on systems change produced a few, uh, a few years back by the Aspen Institute. And it reflects that feeling that sector practitioners often have a feeling as if they are swimming against the current when, when they'd rather be swimming with the current. Um, but unlike the current, um, with systems change, you can actually change the uh, currents that you swim in. And by diagnosing a situation, you can change, change systems in ways that will make them more aligned with what you're trying to do so that you don't feel that you're necessarily fighting. And then here's a quote that represents the, the other aspect of things, um, expanding the scope of impact that you're, you're able to have as, a, as, a, as an initiative beyond those that you directly serve to in, uh, affect um, others who are seeking jobs in the industry in the region. Um, and uh, as John Colburn uh, said in, in this book, for, uh, or this brief from the Casey Foundation, um, systems change is, is a way to expand your impact to go beyond working at uh, a micro level with a limited number of direct participants. So I'll just flag that from our point of view at the National Network of Sector Partners, systems change is integral to the sector approach. Um, and that we really believe that pursuing and achieving systems change is part of what se separates sector initiatives from other workforce development efforts. But what I'd like to do now is to give you a chance to hear from Scott Sheely about the way that he's pursued that agenda in his work in Lancaster County. Um, and so, Scott, why don't you take it from here? Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, yeah. What I'd like to do, folks, is that um, I think one of the things that bothers me oftentimes when uh, I go to presentations is that uh, people do show and tell about a particular project. What I'd really like to do with your help today is to tell you a story about a particular process that happened in a particular community. But I'd like you to make um, use of the questions piece that's over on the right uh, side of your screen. and try to identify as I go through this kind of story, if you hear any uh, best practices that come out of there, things that you might be able to use on a more general basis that would contribute to your sector practice. And uh, hopefully what we can do is compile kind of a list of best practice ideas that come out of this fairly specific, almost a case study of what happened in a particular area. The other thing I want to make clear is that I'm going to be uh, talking a lot about the workforce world uh, and sector practice as it happens there. Please don't let that turn you off because the basic principles, if we do this right, 
should be able to be applied in much the same way in pretty much any other system that uh, is going on. So um, again, this is sectoral work I found over the years as a process. So what I'm going to present is kind of the story of a process kind of picture. And uh, we're really going to ask you then to use that questions piece over on the right-hand side of the screen to identify best practices that we can compile together. So uh, next slide, please. How are we doing? There we go. So uh, the story begins uh, back in uh, the late 1990s when the Lancaster County Workforce Investment Board was actually in the process of moving from a private industry council to a board. And uh, what I appreciate so much about being associated with this board for the last 11 or 12 years, uh, I began my work actually with the board as a private sector member of the board, but is that the, the board from the very beginning has had a very strong private sector approach uh, to what it does. And I can uh, go into more detail offline if anybody's interested in that, but as the board primarily led by private sector people, began to ask the question, what's different now that we are involved in a workforce investment board? Um, how do we actually frame that up? How do we do that? How do we link to the um, intention of the Workforce Investment Act that we be more employer driven and that we be more connected to the economic development approach, uh, see ourselves less as a social service agency and more as an economic development entity? So in the midst of kind of grappling with that question, and I, again, I hope you're thinking about that idea of best practices and you're putting some uh, things into the questions piece over on the right. Um, we basically started that by a concept. Um, we took a close look at Michael Porter's work on clusters, uh, used his uh, concept of a cluster being uh, a little bit different from just a hierarchy of uh, industry. Uh, that a cluster actually contains a supply chain, core industry, and the di distribution chain. And the way we conceptualize a cluster really needs to include all parts of that. What that does is it led us to taking a look at clusters as, um, in some t cases, combining things like mining, manufacturing, construction, and really kind of across the typical way that we would normally think of um, putting together a uh, description of what are the key industries within a regional economy. We identified 20 industry clusters which make up about 99 percent of all employment and uh, we have found as we have used those clusters not only in our area but around the county or around the country rather that they are they pretty much hold true to um, covering the bulk of where employment is. With the, uh, the concept in mind and then using data, uh, what we did is we, we benchmark uh, kind of the characteristics of these clusters, both from a retrospective point of view, in other words, we went back and looked at performance over a certain period of time, and then we were able through the software that we had to actually do a prospective point of view, looking ahead and projecting where that cluster would end up um, down the road. Next slide, please. So the, the net result of that is uh, some work with folks at the University of Minnesota who helped us uh, from their economic de development experience really focus on key demographics that would uh, get us to the point of prioritizing from the 20 clusters, the ones that we wanted to eventually concentrate on to invest in our human capital efforts uh, that the board was ready to make. So again, from the 20 this particular board here in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania uh, chose healthcare, biotechnology, agriculture and food processing, metals and metal fabricating, construction, communications, and automotive services. Now, if you lived around here, that's probably not too much of a surprise. Uh, you know that uh, we are a fairly large agricultural area. In fact, one of the top 10 agriculture producing counties in the United States. We also have some real quirky, interesting things like the world's largest wholesale auto auction. So it's not uh, too far to think that automotive services would be one of our priorities. 
but there are some other interesting pieces to these choices. Again, I could talk more about this uh, offline, but I won't. Biotechnology is one of the smallest clusters that we have. So because we are connected into a larger uh, clustering that happens to the east of us, we've included this as one of our priorities. We, we developed these back in 2001, 2002. They have been our seven priorities ever since as far as um, you know, where we have kind of focused our energies moving forward. Next slide, please. So the big question after you identify um, the, the clusters from the data, and oftentimes this is the hard one, and a lot of people have the uh, difficulty taking this step. It's like, okay, so what have I got now that I've identified the clusters? What, did I, what do I do with this? How do you actually implement some kind of a meaningful intervention that will actually move you down the line in terms of working with the, uh, the companies that are a part of your clustering? Well, what we found is that um, this is, again, kind of a hard part for people that are often oriented to an office, but one of the things is you've got to get out of your seat, you've got to go out and you have to talk to people in the industries. Really, it's the qualitative information that you get from uh, the people out there in the work world that actually begin to turn your data into true intelligence. It's really the way that you know what is the industry thinking, what's its need, and you can begin to drill down into other um, aspects, uh, particularly things like career pathing and how does career advancement work within a particular industry. We did that by organizing companies by segments, uh, inviting them to a series of almost get to know uh, one another types, types of meetings. Um, was, we were able to take advantage of some funding that came from the uh, Commonwealth to uh, basically begin to work with people on uh, the issue which seemed to be their burning issue at the time, which was upskilling their incumbent workforce. As we began to do this, we kind of reinvented the way uh, we actually are offering this kind of training. In the past, the Commonwealth had done a lot of customized job training, basically providing training resources to individual companies. The, the clear difference in the way that this organization uh, happened as we move forward and it spread from Lancaster throughout the Commonwealth is that now we were involved in shared training. We asked individual companies to complete a training plan, but those training plans were collated and prioritized to actually develop a shared training plan uh, for the overall industry partnership. Next slide, please. One of the other things that was very important in this is um, in the very early stages, actually selecting a project manager who is a subject matter expert in the uh, industry that we were working with. Um, basically having a person with this perspective, knowing people in the industry, knowing the industry in terms of the way it operates is a huge plus as you begin working with actually implementing sector types of uh, projects. Um, oftentimes it uh, Several of our partnerships uh, were very much interested in procuring training. We had groups that, were, uh, that helped us interview people that would provide the training. Um, very robust training program that uh, began rolling out. And this would have been in the 2003 to 2004 time frame. One of the, a couple of the other things that are uh, key aspects of what happened, companies matched the public dollars one for one. Cash match, there's always a required cash match. Uh, we found that that way uh, companies have skin in the game. No customized training, as I said, only shared training. Uh, each partnership we found over the years has different uh, uh, content. They need different things, so we've tried to be responsive from basic, from basic skills to advanced technical skills and uh, targeting it at line staff to management. And at its peak, this process, uh, was literally training thousands of incumbent workers uh, each year. So next slide, please. But, you know, when you're out talking to people, uh, this is the thing you always hate to hear. It's, um, you know, what you're doing is really good, but what I really need, and what we began to hear from employers, 
And I hope as you're listening to this, you're going to use that question uh, piece to write down best practices, by the way. I don't see anything in there, so uh, don't be afraid to use that. Uh, Jim's not going to jump at you or anything. Um, but what I really need as employers, you know, were coming back to us, is that we need you to continue what you're doing within the incumbent workforce, but we really need help with the entering workforce. Um, as we came to them as part of the public workforce investment system, uh, people said things like, well, your labor exchange services are fine. But again, what I really need is, and this is what we heard over and over and over again, we need people who are entry-level employers who can read, write, and compute. Uh, we need people who know how to act at work and can balance the demands of their work and home lives. It came out in things like, you know, people really not need to know when they get the job, they actually have to come to work. Um, you've, you've all heard this. This is a part of the uh, soft skill uh, piece that we often hear as we uh, work with employers. The other thing, the more that we push this, is that um, we kept hearing more and more, I don't need a degree. I need people that can do what I need them to do. Uh, very much a skill-oriented uh, request uh, from the employers. And uh, actually, if you go to that next slide, keep going. There we go. Um, ultimately, the long and the short of it was that people were saying the one stop and the staffing, and not only the one stop, but my staffing services as well, are really not delivering what I need. So for us, that was a uh, major wake up call and really led the one stop center in our particular area to ask some serious questions about uh, the way we do business. Uh, and if you would go to the next slide, please. So the, the midst, in the midst of this redesigning of the one-stop and kind of a thinking through, we developed some basic um, processes and kind of some core principles uh, that we wanted to build into the system. I will say from a process standpoint, the very first thing we did was to use a lean manufacturing technique called value stream mapping to actually map our process and to begin looking for where the bottlenecks appeared. The other part is we went back to try to um, reconsider what was happening uh, in our world. One of the things, that, the goal that we put out there was what we would really like is to have one system that would serve multiple client groups and not just easy groups. We wanted um, you know, to uh, work with everybody that comes through the door, including some of those that have some of the major challenges that are there. Part of what we realized is that if we were going to do the job right, we really needed to start talking to people about their job search and about their ultimate goal, which is not to come into the one-stop center every day. Their ultimate goal is to get a job. So as we were thinking through the system and what we would need to do to build out, uh, we basically uh, said that job search begins the moment the job seeker walks through the door. The other thing that we did, which was a radical change, I don't, those of you who are involved in the workforce system know that everybody wants to talk about eligibility. What we found is that there were so many people that we were so concerned with this conversation about that we forgot to ask the question of whether they're really committed. Uh, we had many people who were declared eligible that just dropped away and we never saw them again. So what we wanted to do is to look into this idea of commitment of the job seeker before asking all these paperwork questions about eligibility. The other thing that I think this was, uh, this was hard for us to kind of figure out, but um, ultimately what we realized is that um, we were not very good at providing good job information. And again, don't just stop there, but we also were not very good at career counseling. It's how do we embed a real career counseling role into the system so that we can be using the good data that we have to actually get people uh, connected to career paths that would be meaningful? And then uh, another aspect, uh, we also wanted to be sure that we set clear standards for work, work, for work readiness 
and we decided to use the work keys testing process with the idea of the achievement of a national credential, which is the national career readiness credential being the ultimate outcome. So, um, and if you go to the next slide, please. So when you set those kind of standards for people, one of the things you have to confront right away is that there will be many people, if we're using this system for everyone, that will not be able to reach that um, standard initially. So it's very important to build in ample opportunities for remediation so that everybody can be uh, successful. What that meant for us is really building a much stronger partnership with our Title II, which would be our adult basic education and English as second language provider, and really stepping up their involvement and to the extent that it was necessary, perhaps actually using Workforce Investment Act funds to uh, provide some of those services, to actually pay our Title II provider a little bit more to be able to do that. Another sea change that developed, and a lot of this developed during the time that we had ARRA funding, was really to pilot a new way to do training. Again, working off of the idea that many employers had put out there that uh, they don't necessarily need a credential. What they need are people with skills. We began experimenting with uh, short-term skill-based training. Oftentimes, um, the employer was directly involved in actually framing up that kind of training to the extent even where several companies actually gave us their training programs that we were able to incorporate into the training we did at the One Stop Center. Gradually, over a period of about four or five years, we have shifted our training dollars to the point where we spend very little money on the traditional individual training account and much more money on this kind of short-term skill-based training. Again, any of you who are interested in how we do that, I'd be happy to have the offline conversation with you. Um, we have some stuff that we could actually send you. Um, what we found is that we really wanted employers to be much more involved with doing recruiting. We actually connected the employer directly to the short-term training. Uh, we supported both pl placement and retention by not only our internal case managers kind of on the push end of things, but also by engaging our business services team kind of on the pool end of things to make sure that placements actually get done and that retention goals are actually met. And then a key part of this was really to reorganize staff so that rather than being in the silos that are caused by the departments and the funding and all the rest of that, that we would actually have a functionally or organized uh, staff, both functionally organized and functionally supervised, where, uh, believe it or not, state staff people actually supervise non-state staff people and vice versa. Um, that one took a little while, but uh, we're getting to the point where uh, that's worked out uh, fairly well. So um, let me just stop there and see if there are any questions, and um, then I'll finish the story uh, when we come back to it in just a couple minutes. Well, Scott, there, there are a lot of questions and uh, a lot of comments. I'll just share a few of the best practices that people have been flagging. Um, Janet, well, Janet Welch says that the idea of having a, a shared training plan that you mentioned um, is an excellent is an excellent idea. That was something that she flagged as a best practice. Linda Quinones Lopez of Perscolas uh, totally agrees with your comment about uh, assessing suitability before eligibility, um, and uh, says that at Perscolas they really consider suitability as um, you know as a, a major factor. Eligibility alone is just not enough to ensure success. Um, Kate Anderson um, uh, in Colorado at the state uh, was talking about how your implementation process for this work resembled um, what they're doing around um, implementing incumbent worker training. So um, I think that may have to do with some of the uh, economic uh, analysis that preceded this, this work. Um, so those are some of the, uh, some of the, the takeaways that uh, people have come up with so far. Did you Thanks. want to elaborate on any of those? 
No, but I think you're picking up the good stuff. And, you know, I think th these are spot on in terms of what you can take away from this. That um, Let me go on and kind of offer some comments, kind of my own comments. But, again, keep doing this. If you have comments on the uh, best practice ideas, uh, keep throwing those out to Jim, and we'll stop at the end and kind of do the same thing. So thanks, everybody. And, keep, and, keep responding. Oh, and Scott, I, I will say that uh, we also do have questions, but why don't we let you continue, and then we'll, we'll uh, get to some of those questions um, a after, you, after you've finished. That'll be great. Thank you. So uh, next slide. So, I mean, ultimately, when you do this kind of redesign, this is systems change at work. And uh, what you want to do is uh, really begin seeing whether what you had intended is indeed what happens. So let me just share with you some of the, um, the effects that we've seen. This, this system, kind of the total rework has been in place for two years. We were moving in that direction up to four years ago. But uh, we've had at least two years under our belt to really talk about some more positive results. First of all, our intention to make this a, a system that will accommodate multiple client groups has actually worked. Um, we have seen uh, dislocated workers, persons transitioning off of welfare, uh, mature workers, incumbent workers. We have a very large program for ex-offenders. Even folks who have been homeless, we found out usually after the fact that people have been living in their cars. Um, not a good thing that we would want, but these stories kind of surface after the fact. And we are exploring using this with uh, some of our uh, WIA youth programming and also our TANF youth programming as well. We found that everybody can participate in the system. Everybody can be successful. Some people need a little bit more work as far as the uh, remedial kind of things, but we're prepared to deliver that. And I mean, the net result, just one example of that is we literally have I uh, had about 12,000 people who have finished our workforce readiness program and have gotten the National Career Readiness Certificate. That's just one example of how the system has worked for so many people. Uh, the other thing that we have found that has been, it's been really what has allowed us to deal with some of the budget cutbacks and such, is that if you have a series of standardized services, what happens is that it really allows your case managers to refer to those services and then to spend their time doing case management um, and doing that in a more time effective, cost effective kind of way. Uh, we see the standardized services as a place to refer to, but it's not a dumping ground. Case managers must still be involved with the person even as they're going through uh, the training, the, um, the workforce readiness process and all the rest of it. And that's true both for our internal case managers and also if people refer from outside organizations, the case manager still must be involved. And I think for many of us who have been practitioners in this world, you know, we know that case management is oftentimes the missing piece that if it's done well can actually help people be much more successful. Next slide, please. The other part is that I think the, the proof of a system's ability to be resilient and respond to unexpected things that happen, um, that's where we want to see this. Uh, and we really see the effect of some of these system changes. Um, two blips that happen in the system, very concrete things that happened here in Pennsylvania. Uh, one thing is that the, um, if you could go back to the last slide, net effect. Nope. One of the things that happened was that the, um, the unemployment law in Pennsylvania changed to, uh, we were one of the few states in the country that did not require a, a work search for unemployment insurance recipients. That changed in early 2011, which we thought, all of us, I believe, uh, thought that we were um, on the right track with that. But it actually resulted in about a 50% increase in traffic uh, to the one-stop center. I'm not sure that we were prepared for that. Uh, what we realized is that because the um, UI system in Pennsylvania is largely a call center driven type of thing, people would come to us as basically the place where they could get the face-to-face -face contact. That has worked out well, but um, we are seeing, as I said, a 50% increase in traffic 
from uh, last year to this year. The other thing that happened is that um, in 2012 there was a dramatic cutback at the state level in TANF funding where we had to reduce our local one-stop staff from 12 to 6. The fact that we had this system in place uh, basically where people could use the standardized services allowed us to keep the case management piece of TANF alive and then to use the rest of the system basically to provide the other services. If we would not have done the system change and the system rework, I am sure that we would not have been able to cope with that as well. The other, one of the other net effects is we see our relationship with employers growing dramatically. We figure that we have roughly 500 employers that we have what I would consider to be a close-in relationship with. Uh, our business services team, there's an account manager that's assigned to every one of those 500 uh, employers. They are called on uh, regularly, uh, monthly, um, quarterly for a personal visit. We believe that our relationship with employers has improved uh, as the system has become more responsive. And again, that added on to the incumbent worker piece has been a very positive thing. We have seen increasing uh, hiring out of these new training options that are available, and ultimately the county has one of the lowest unemployment rates uh, in the uh, Commonwealth. So I need to, to kind of move quickly to uh, wrap up. So. There's challenges. If we could go to the next slide, I'm not going to get through all this, but um, challenges relate to how do you get better career counseling, how do you help systems interface where that interface is not obvious, uh, sharing information among staff so that you can do the collaboration that's needed. Sometimes labor agreements have been a problem, uh, particularly with state staff. Um, this flexibility and training is very important, but Overall, keeping the employer engaged is one of the paramount uh, challenges, and we really need to keep that in the front. Next slide, please. All through this process that happened in changing the one-stop center to be more responsive, we found our industry partners that came out of our incumbent worker industry project um, to be key. They helped us validate the, the secondary data, particularly as we implemented career pathways type of model. They helped us design the short-term training. They are engaged with job seekers during the job search process. They um, actually come in and help with some of the training. They are listing their job orders on the system of record and uh, they are working also with our case managers and business services representatives to uh, retain people as well. And finally just uh, a couple of things that have happened recently. Um, not only are we meeting all of our performance standards, um, this is on the results slide, um, but the governor of Pennsylvania has just announced that Lancaster is being used as the model of integration for Workforce Investment Act and TANF services that will be rolled out around the Commonwealth uh, between now and the end of 2015. We also are working with the Department of Corrections uh, with the idea that a day report center for state and county employees um, would be possible here at the uh, one-stop center. So the long and the short of it in terms of results, in spite of a lot of barriers, we're getting the job done in spite of the challenges and we are getting good results. Um, all of this grows out of the relationship that we have had with employers who have been the drivers of uh, our overall planning, but even down to the point of the system changes that need to happen. So at that point, let me wrap up, turn it back to Jim. I'd be happy to go wherever you want to go with this, Jim. Well, Scott, uh, there's so much here, and there is uh, great, great interest among folks to dig in um, to all the details, which unfortunately we won't be able to do. I'll, I'll pull out some of the high-level questions, and then if we have time after uh, both Jessica and Jack have had a chance to speak, uh, we'll get back to some of them. Um, you mentioned some of the restructuring of uh, supervision relationships and um, how work gets done among staff. And um, first, you mentioned, I think, some materials related to that that might be of interest. And you're, you're willing to share that with folks? Yes, we are. Sure. So maybe we could help distribute that if it's appropriate. I'll um, be happy to. The, uh, related to that, um, Gretchen Sullivan said she loved the focus on 
functional organization and supervision rather than uh, by the various silos. But she acknowledged, as I think you did, that it's a challenge to implement. And I'm just wondering, was, was there anything particular about how you made that happen that other folks could learn from? Was it something that was in your, uh, within your direct control, or did you need to both persuade people and bring them on board in some way? How did, how did, it, how did that work? All of the above. First of all, there's the will to do it. Secondly, there's the, uh, presenting the common sense of the model. And sometimes the very last thing that you have to do is just wait for retirements. <laughs> um, as far as the, generating the will to do it, we talked a lot about analysis um, and both both data and then this sort of process analysis. Was was that did that feed into generating the will to do it? Yeah, and I think and maybe the thing I didn't talk as much about is that this our governing board, our policy board had a vision as a result of all the work that we did in terms of kind of soliciting the input and such. It's the vision that actually created the will, or I don't know if it's vice versa or not, but the will and the vision go together. That if you can see where you're going, then I think it's ultimately up to the people who are the, the ones that are driving the system forward to kind of put the will piece in there. Okay. Uh, I'll just ask about the other aspect, which I think came through very clearly for folks, which was the extent to which your uh, understanding of the industry's needs and responsiveness to that really helps to both organize and drive things. And there were some questions about how you're staying on top of changes as the economy changes in that and how that affects sort of your your development of, of new act, uh, offerings as time goes on? Well, we have, uh, our partnerships are very strong. They have been in existence anywhere from six to ten years now. So even though the funding has been reduced by the Commonwealth over the period of time, we still have functional partnerships where uh, employers are meeting regularly with our project managers. That is pr the primary vehicle for the nitty-gritty of what's happening. But Keep in mind that we have a very strong relationship with other places where employers are, including the Chamber of Commerce, uh, economic development people. Um, personally, I just I actually go out and uh, go with the business services team, and oftentimes we're visiting companies on a regular basis and asking questions. I always found that um, when I did sales work for my own company, getting out and actually doing it yourself gives you a much better idea of what's going on. So it's, it's a combination of those things, while at the same time remembering people that are out there in business, they are all busy too. And you can't keep bugging them. You've got to do it in a fairly efficient way. And you can only do it a couple times a year, or else they start turning you off. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, it sounds like, among other things, you've built a structure that then allows for the ongoing input that can drive drive change as you go forward. Yeah, the structure organizes the relationships, which are kind of the underlying piece. And it's uh -huh. this long-term relationship that has built up that has really, it's given us almost the capital that we need to keep things going. Okay. Well, Scott, there are many, many more questions, uh, but we're going to move on now. And maybe we'll have time to get back to them um, uh, afterwards. I want to turn now to Jessica Goodhart to talk about uh, a different kind of systems change that involves both the both some direct programmatic work, but also some changes in, a, in an industry's practices and uh, policy that help make that happen. So, um, so Jessica, let's turn things over to you to hear a little bit about Repower LA. Great, thank you so much, and thank you, Scott. That was really, uh, really good, interesting presentation, and I was really struck by the uh, extent of collaboration and, and research with the, uh, around employer needs, and I think that's always really key and where we need to start. Um, I um, will, let me just wait for the slides. We can go to the next. Um, let me tell you first a little bit about my organization, Lane, Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy. Um, we are an advocacy organization, and we were founded in 1993. Uh, uh, and really, our focus is 
working in different industries to win policies that create good jobs and broad community benefits. And so some of the things you might, you might have heard of us in connection with living wage. Um, we're one of the first organizations to work on a living wage. I'm sorry, City of LA was one of the first, first cities to pass a, a living wage um, that applies to uh, contracted workers. Um, we have worked in the construction industry to create career pathways and expand opportunity and win uh, you know, a project uh, labor agreements that assure standards for that work. And we've done also, uh, we've uh, worked on a um, landmark clean trucks program, um, upgrading uh, the trucks at ports of LA and um, uh, done work to also improve uh, standards for, for truck drivers in that industry. So we have kind of a broad portfolio. Um, and you, if you're interested, I've included the website um, to learn more about our organization. Why don't we go to the next slide? Um, Jim, can we go to the next slide? Great, perfect. So kind of what unites um, our projects or campaigns is that we have um, we have projects that have each one an industry focus. And we have, you, you know, in terms of systems change, and we're kind of organized, we're all about systems change. We're all about looking at that industry and, and moving it, moving policy to exp so that we can expand opportunity for low-income people, for people who have barriers to employment, or for low-wage workers who, you know, we're trying to improve wages in those jobs. And so um, it's a little different, I know, than some organizations in the work, but I think that um, kind of advocacy orientation is something, I think there are elements, there are lessons that, that, um, that people can take and apply to their own work and actually apply to their own lives <laughs> when, you have a, when you're facing a challenge. And so when we think about uh, an industry, whether it's logistics or hospitality or retail or, in, in my case, utility, um, we think about... Um, you know, all the, the elements we need to make change. So one of it is, is research, of course, right? That needs to be a, a cornerstone research, both in terms of understanding that industry and understanding through policy, legal research, and also research that helps us make the case for the policy that we're going to be pushing. Um, obviously, we need fundraising. We need um, to, to support the work. And organizing is really at the basis of that all. And that, that means different things. It means sometimes community organizing, sometimes organizing workers, and sometimes um, and often um, forming, forming broad coalition between different stakeholders. So environment, we work with environmental groups, workforce organizations, space, uh, organizations that have grassroots spaces, and um, uh, with labor. And then, um, uh, political advocacy is also important, um, and by that I mean really understanding who the decision makers are and how, and the organizing is really key, obviously, to moving those people. And com the arrows don't exactly work here, so, but anyway, and communications as well. We think about how do we talk about the work that we're doing, what's yeah. the best way to message it, and what are, you know, how do we, um, sometimes we'll have, we'll do, we'll try to do earn media to help bring attention to the work. So that's kind of a broad framework in terms of how we work. If we can go to the next. So the particular focus of um, our the project that I've worked on, which is called Repower LA, has been focused on our utility department of water and power, which is the largest municipally owned utility in the country, um, employs 9,000 workers, and um, like utilities around the country is undergoing a dramatic transformation. Um, our utility is 40% reliant on coal and is moving off coal um, entirely and has to really rebuild a lot of its infrastructure, partly also because it's aging. Um, these, this, this movement has costs, which has impacts on ratepayers, And of course, we have the challenge of, of unemployment. And we saw in that industry also a tremendous opportunity. Um, this was a, 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 a utility, as a municipal utility, it, it, like many others, it, it underinvested in energy efficiency services. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk nationwide about energy efficiency and how it's a job creator, right? Um, and so we knew that there was that link. Um, and also, you know, there was a great argument to be made. Look, you, this, was, this was a utility that needed to raise rates. 
investment in energy efficiency is a really key way to protect customers uh, in that rate increase and just reduce the, the, um, the costs overall for the power system. And of course, like a lot of utilities around the country, um, there was an aging workforce. So 40% of these employees were at or near retirement age, and the shortages were especially acute in some of the skilled craft work. Um, and so, so, so these were some. This is sort of the the environment that we faced. And you want? Should we go to the next slide? And um, so the original vision that we had was one that was, um, in part, we were, we were lucky to have a, a partner uh, in the union that represented most of the utility workers that had for a long time wanted to, oh, I think we went ahead by mistake. Oops. There we go. OK. Um, that for one had uh, wanted to create a uh, training program, an on-the-job training program, that would serve as a pipeline to utility careers. And it had been it was very well known in throughout LA that it's very difficult to get a job at DWP. And once you get a job, you never leave. Um, but there were serious barriers for some of the, particularly folks from very high unemployment communities. And one of those. Um, first and foremost was a civil service exam that people had to take. So the idea was to bring people in and without, and they would be civil service, you know, exempt employees. They would be union members, but they'd be doing training. And, then, and as they did work, they would be prepared to take this civil service exam. And then part of the original uh, vision of the Repower LA uh, project and coalition was also, as I mentioned, to increase investment in energy efficiency. And so this was something that could bring our labor uh, partner together with environmental groups around a vision of how we green the utility while putting local residents to work and providing services for um, customers who you know, typically don't have access to energy efficiency services, so low-income people, small business, et cetera. So that was, the, that was the vision that we started. And there were, other, there were other sort of twists and turns that I could get into, but those were two of the core things we knew we had to to move forward on. So I think we can go to the next. Great. So um, we also faced some very significant obstacles. One was this fact that the department hadn't had a rate increase in years, and there was a hiring freeze, and they were cutting back. And um, there was also a lot of division within the city and even within the department coming off a pretty bitter rate battle where the department, and I won't go into it, but it had left people you know, kind of feeling burned and not feeling like a lot could happen at DWP at that moment. And it's a very large, it's a very large uh, bureaucracy, as you can imagine. And so just making changes, we really had to, to really understand and do pretty deep work on understanding how that bureaucracy worked. Um, I mentioned the historic and underinvestment in energy efficiency, and I think another challenge was really just to establish our credibility. That while Lane has been around since 1993, um, we ha are well known in LA City. Um, we weren't really well known in this arena, and so we had to kind of, you know, ha the question was, how can we be listened to as we move forward and advocate this program is important when you know the, there are other concerns that the utility had. So we also had some things. Um, going for us um, as we went into it. Um, one of them was this partnership with this, the uh, utility union. One of them was uh, work, a lot of work we had done with the mayor's office. And the mayor uh, appoints the utilities board and is a, is a key player. Um, but we, um, we also, the other thing that kick-started it was that the, the, the city had received a, had, had, uh, received a grant, an ARA grant, to do weatherization. So the utility, for the first time in its history, um, was going to undertake uh, energy efficiency upgrade work that actually nonprofit providers um, didn't want to do for various reasons. So the utility had to kind of swing into gear and learn the program and start the um, learn, how, learn how to do energy efficiency work and launch this utility pre-craft trainee program, all the while meeting the demands of an ARA grant. Um, so that was kind of where we started. 
And then one of the things also that we that the that was done very early on was that the our our you know we had a real advocate in the mayor's office who said, look, um, it's a really key that the, the the utility which had been you know somewhat insular in the past partner with key community organizations. So obviously the Repower LA Lane uh, our partners in South LA were some of those um, organizations, but we also uh, developed partnerships with the WorkSource Center and with LA Trade Technical College, which um, provided some of the weatherization training for these trainees. And so that's that's a little bit of the sort of setting the scene. And I'm just going to stop here for a minute and see if people have just questions about that. Jessica, I think folks are eager to, you, I think you set the stage, but folks are eager to hear how Lane has dealt with the situation or okay. taken all of the factors that you identified and then started to make some change happen. So okay. uh, I would say keep going. Keep going. Okay. So I'm going to run through a series of slides very quickly that's not going to be the how, the, the how we did. It's just going to be the what we accomplished, and then we'll kind of backtrack to the how. So this I'll spend a little more time on because this is the key workforce piece. But one of the first victories uh, for our coalition was launching this utility precraft trainee program with the RF funds in uh, May of 2011. Um, it's really a, an exciting program because it's a cohort, right? And you all know who do workforce development to have to, to they hire 35 folks at a time to be able to work with these folks where they can, you know, work help each other and be mentored at the same time. Um, was pretty fantastic. They hired 35. We've got 33 uh, still working, and two of them who left. One of them, you know, they left for for various reasons, like you know, personal reasons. So we've had this tremendous success rate with this first group. Um, oh, can we go back? Sorry, I'll go through the other ones faster. I promise. Um, and so basically, what it, it started out as an 18-month program, it has been extended. But the, but, peop, but these trainees are exposed to, as they're doing weatherization work in people's homes, they're exposed to different um, work in the utility. And then they take online courses at night. And then they have soft skills training and safety training. So it's a very intense program, very intense, which has been a challenge as well, um, but also with a fair amount of support. And they're working. They're making $16 an hour, plus um, they get uh, ben benefits, health benefits. Um, so that's that was our first victory. We had the second class hired in 2012, and a third class is expected um, this um, this month to be hired. So next slide. So then a key victory was um, more than doubling the energy efficiency budget of the departments. This was a very heavy lift, and so you can imagine that when we're talking about systems change, we had a full-time community organizer. We had, you know, research. We had, and we, and this was, and obviously we were doing a lot of political work to to make this happen. But the key thing for this is that this is something that, on some level, the department had to do. They were under investing in, in energy efficiency. It's something they wanted to do. The council wanted to do, and they kind of needed the push and the support to make this a priority. And so we. Um, you know, we gave them that push um, through a whole campaign that I'll talk about in a minute. And then in, in the next slide. Now, the other thing is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, dollars are great. And obviously, you can't really do anything without them. But it's also important that there's a vision there. And so in August, um, the board adopted some guiding principles for their energy efficiency portfolio. That you know, which includes many programs, including the one that makes use of UPCTs. There are rebates. There are lots of different things in that portfolio. But we wanted to in our coal. If our coalition it was really important that what we had fought for for you know year and a half or two years, that those 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 um, elements are there. And um, you know, when the utility recently released its business plan. The guiding principles were on the first page. Um, and, and so we feel like we've kind of enshrined the, what we've won. Because for a lot of people, energy, for a lot of utilities, you know, while there might be talk of jobs, um, actually leveraging energy efficiency uh, investments to create good jobs is really not part, generally part of their core practice. So this was 
um, really key. In the next slide, please. And then, you know, what made this budget actually real was the rate vote, which happened, and also kind of explained in some ways why, you know, we were able to, you know, the department really understood they needed com community support. And one thing that we had to do, and this is sort of the politics of it, is really to, while we advocated for energy efficiency, we stressed that we were not out there advocating for a rate increase. And this was really key because our base of support was in places like South Los Angeles, like East Los Angeles, where, you know, people were very concerned about rising costs. And we also had to make it clear that while, you know, the department maybe needed to raise rates, this was not, energy efficiency was not the reason. And so that was something that we sort of helped the department with their message around that so people could understand that energy efficiency really accounted for very little of their cost um, overall, but it needed to be there um, in order to protect customers. So great, and you know, over the period of time, the this, the weatherization program uh, really took off. It took it was a bit of a slow start, um, honestly, and we got some scrutiny for that because the department had to ramp up. Um, but once they got going, one thing that the Department of Water and Power can do is scale, and so they um, and and here there's some pictures of some of our trainees and a customer um, who've gotten their home. Uh, her home weatherized, and you know, telling these stories with the, to decision makers and, and getting these folks in front of decision makers was obviously really key. Um, so next slide. So this is just these are sort of some you know big numbers you know that and and it was important that people understood the big vision while the trainee program itself was just as part of the. Is part is really part of a larger story for the Repower LA coalition, but for us, it's really the heart because for our coalition members who are finally getting actually jobs through the training program, they understand the difference between you know job multipliers and career, real careers, and the UPCT program represents a real uh, career, um, you know, an opportunity at the utility. So that's the um, those are some of the just sort of some of the big numbers. Okay. Next slide. So, you know, again, when we talk about this systems change, I feel like these are just some some of the um, a little some a little photo montage of some of the organizing that we did. Um, we obviously needed to advocate and lobby for uh, an energy the energy efficiency budget for also. The um, pro utility pre craft training program, while everyone agreed it was a good idea, it was stuck in the bureaucracy. And so we had to mobilize at board meetings. Um, we had to mobilize at city council. Probably a key turning point for us was, um, in terms of establishing our credibility, was putting together a big community meeting out in South Los Angeles and having the general manager come. Um, and that sort of established our legitimacy. And for the first time, the utility was hearing from a part of the city that hadn't really been active and vocal. And another thing that our coalition advocated for, in addition for the training program, the energy efficiency budget, and the principles, was really to, to make sure that the utility was giving a fair chance to people with criminal backgrounds. This was something that was really important to our coalition. Um, and something that the union had, you know, that while there are people with backgrounds in the utility, um, because of Homeland uh, uh, the Patriot Act stuff, that it was very there was increased scrutiny and it was difficult. But sometimes people were going above and beyond what was um, the law was requiring, and and people were being kept out of of, of being considered even. So we really um, have uh, have become sort of the advocates for that in a in a really key way. And this the thing on the top left is just an apple pie. We delivered an apple pie to. Uh, every council office um, saying that uh, energy efficiency was like apple pie. How could you be against it? So oh, next slide. And of course, here are some of the key decision makers. Obviously, people. Uh, this is something people wanted to be able to support, and we wanted to give them the chance. And so we have the mayor, the general manager of the Department of Water and Power, to his 
left um, the council president as to his right, and so and community all around. And this is obviously the kind of you know the kind of um, vision that you know elected leaders they want to be. This is something great. They want to be a part of it. And so all, this was this happened very late in the campaign, but this was obviously something that uh, we we saw as 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 you know this could be a real win, and and, and it's in front of someone's home who's been. She's had her home weatherized. So next slide. So some of the lessons, and I'm sure, like Scott said, you probably can think of more um, that I haven't um, identified. But certainly, I think, and what I sh what you know, I certainly share with Scott's presentation is you really need to understand your industry. You need to understand the career paths. You also need to understand who the decision makers are and who influences them. Um, I think one of the things that we did with Repower LA was really connecting city officials with their public purpose. I think everybody gets caught in the bureaucracy and the politics, and actually people really want to make a difference. And so getting people out to community meetings, it takes time, it's, it's resource intensive, but it's really energizing, I think, for everyone involved. Um, and then having this kind of inside-outside strategy. We needed to be inside City Hall building relationships with staffers and, and so on, but we also needed to be out in the community and then bring those people out into the community. And then I think this work that we're all doing around trying to create careers and not just jobs is really hard work. And I think there is resistance uh, on some level. I mean, we certainly felt it with the R of you know, funding where there was a lot of pressure, and it's understandable that that funding translate very quickly into jobs. That was the purpose. It was stimulus grants. But what we ended up doing was using that money to launch a long-term program uh, you know, that's now funded with, by the utility. And so I think at the beginning, um, you know, it was, you know, we had to sort of educate people for, for, that to, for them to see that vision and really also become the people who benefited, have them be the spokespeople. And then I think what I said before about policy language um, is is really something a way you can kind of make the work outlive um, the 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 campaign. And so that's I think that's where I'm going to stop um, and just open it up for questions. Jessica, that that, that is that's really great. Um, I first want to just flag people continued in the vein of identifying best practices. Um, right. So a couple of things that fo folks particularly liked about what, what you're doing, um, we heard from, from uh, one participant, great idea to combine weatherization with utility work experience. Having a tough time in our region, region getting commitment to weatherization programs. Um, maybe I can ask about where that commitment comes from um, in, uh, in LA or how you've helped to bring about that commitment to weatherization programs? I mean, again, I, I think the commitment came out of the organizing on some level. Um, we were lucky to have a union partner that has considerable clout in our, and who really you know, sh shared this vision um, mm -hmm. and really has been a leader on it. And we're lucky to have allies in the mayor's office who also saw it. But I think each of those actors on their own could not have make, made it happen without sort of the glue of communities. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, I think this may be particular. I mean, people, some people have uh, investor-owned utilities or different than publicly-owned utilities. Publicly-owned utilities are really interesting because they are accountable to the local elected body. And serve, mm -hmm. and so for those, and so the the sort of political pressure is more local, and so I think mm -hmm. there's an opportunity to really look at those employers and think about what um, you know, think about how these this kind of a program can uh, can be replicated. So that's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's something for people to think about who have MOUs in their region. Mm -hmm. you, it, it's it's clear that you did some analysis to identify the leverage points and to build on, on the assets that you, you, you described it as you're lucky to have, although I'm, I'm sure it's not just luck which, which <laughs> those, those relationships. Right. Um, 
Right. I mean, I think it's about going deep in the industries you have, identifying what the assets are, what the pressure points are. And it's not to say they don't, you know, for, you know, investor-owned utilities that they don't exist. A lot of those conversations are happening up at Sacramento at the Public Utilities Commission. So there's a, there's, and they actually in some ways have a stronger, ironically, they have a stronger tradition of doing energy efficiency work. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I, you know, I, if I start talking utility, then I, I should just stop. But, <laughs> you know, so they, 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 but I think, yeah, it's, just, it's about understanding what those assets are. And I also think just for workforce organizations, really thinking about utilities and the aging workforce issue for that industry, I think is something that people can, can mm -hmm. think about. Well, so um, one of the comments, again, about best practice was, identifying ways for the Department of Water and Power to better serve their customers and still advocate for community stakeholders represents a great way to partner with a major business, particularly in Los Angeles. So it's clear that the, the model has fans among our participants. Great. Um, if I can just ask uh, one other question about the model, it seems clear that there's an interrelation, interrelationship between this programmatic approach, the utility pre trainee program, and the, the advocacy and the other systems change elements, including um, the funding for energy efficiency work. Right. Can you talk a little bit about the interplay of those and, and what right. drives what? Right. So um, the utility pre-craft training program really has the potential to be much broad, broader than energy efficiency, right? We'd like to look at the water system as well and see if we can grow that program there. Um, but what we're able to do with energy efficiency is to take a portion of that budget and say, okay, this is for what the term of art is in the utility industry is direct install. So that's where a utility or a contractor who works for a utility goes out and actually does the work. And that's usually reserved for hard to reach customers. Um, low income, low moderate income customers, small businesses, and there's actually a piece for schools as well. Mm -hmm. And um, what was really great is there's this natural coalition between the customers and you know serving customers who also are in communities where jobs are needed. And mm -hmm. so now, whereas the utility has kind of had a fraught relationship with customers, and so, you know, for very although it's actually provided very reliable service, it's the customer service piece hasn't been its strength. Now you have utility workers going out and really me, me being the face of the utility in the community and also sort of being educators about energy efficiency, which when at a time when right we need to move off, um, you know, we can't we can't act like energy is just a you know an unending just an ending supply of it, that sort of education piece is really important. So there's this kind of lovely convergence of environmental, community building, jobs issues, you know, all at once. And I think, I don't think utilities have really totally tapped into that potential mm -hmm. yet. Okay. You know, I, I, I wonder if there was something about some of the early wins that you got that then fed into the long-term wins about getting that funding and, and the policy language. Did uh, the establishment of that program um, or some of the early smaller policy wins set the stage? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the um, the, co the utility pre-craft trainee program had strong and passionate support from a coalition of community organizations who had seen job efforts that had really not led to jobs. You know what I mean? That they and they saw that this was real. You know, it might have been bigger. You know, could have been. A, you know, we all want thousands of jobs, but it was real. They understood it was transparent. They understood how the waiting list worked, and they could see people getting into those jobs. And so that energized a coalition that was then ready to fight on a whole range of of other things, including more. You know, they understood the link between the energy efficiency piece as well. So uh -huh. okay. getting that program was really key. It also meant that we had a face for a worker face for our campaign. So we had utility pre-craft trainees coming to community meetings and saying, you know, I live in East Los Angeles. I, I'm a utility pre-craft trainee. And this is what the program's done for my life and my family. 
and you know this is why I support Repowerlay. And then alongside that, you had Sierra Club, and then you'd have um, you know uh, a community you know community resident. And eventually, as the program took off, we had I've had my home done, and it's saving me money. You know, so we had this whole this whole story to tell. That's great. There was there's one question uh, that maybe we'll, we'll close with. I, I want to give Jack uh, at least a few minutes to talk about what we've learned from other sector missions around the country. But uh, there was a specific question about the ex-offender uh, issue and criminal background. And can you can you just say what what specifically that was, and whether there was any particular lever that you you pushed to advance the agenda? Oh, with the the, the ex-offender issue, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 the utility is covered by the City of LA hiring guidelines, which make it clear that there's not a blanket prohibition on people with felonies um, and backgrounds being hired. There's, you know, it, it depends on the felony. It depends on a lot of different things. But what was happening is with the first cohort, the utility was saying, nobody with a, we don't want anyone with a felony. And that was actually not within the law. Um, they were very nervous about because people were going they were going into people's homes. But what we pushed for was that they can't, you know, they need to judge people on a case by case basis. And what really made the difference was us raising it at community meeting, community forums, and then having a very passionate advocate at the union who was actually saying, wait, what happened with that person? Let's look at that person. Let's look at what the real story is. And so we were able to get people through. Uh, I feel like there's honestly more work to be done in that area. Like we, we need to make it more at, you know, at a policy level where there's change that's not so much dependent on who's, at, you know, who's there to advocate for people. Um, but I think we've made it part of the conversation um, where it hasn't, hadn't been before. Well, thank you. Uh, there, there, there's more we could talk about, but I want to give Jack a chance to talk uh, about what we've seen around the country and maybe present a way of thinking about some of what we've heard both from you, Jessica, and from Scott earlier. So let's, uh, let's transition now to uh, Jack Mills, who directs the National Network of Sector Partners, and um, hear what you have to say. Can you go back one more? And then click on the Hello, uh, everybody. This is Jack. And, um, you know, the system change that we've heard about from Scott and from Jessica, um, they're very instructive, but they're also very different. I'm going to step back and talk about what we at NNSP have learned about systems change um, from work like what Scott and Jessica have described, um, from other sector initiatives that are NNSP members, and also from a good deal of research on systems change. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So um, we find that there are four goals for systems change. And strategies to achieve these goals need to meet the needs of employers that have good jobs. But the goals themselves have to do with the workforce. And you can see them on the slide here. Now, it's true that these goals can be achieved by effective programs. Uh, but by bringing about changes in systems, a sector initiative can do two things that go beyond what uh, an effective program can do. So first of all, uh, systems changes can overcome barriers uh, to success that are faced by employers or individuals or a sector initiative itself that are beyond the scope of what the program can have an effect on. Uh, they can also have a broad scale impact. If you think about a program, it's going to serve a certain number of employers and a certain number of individuals. But the systems change can go beyond that group of employers and individuals to affect a much larger uh, uh, range of people and employers. So let's go to the next slide. You know, there are certain types of systems change that can achieve the four goals that uh, you saw in the last slide. Uh, first of all, change in the workforce development system. And when I say that, these uh, changes can affect the broad range of services that benefit job seekers and workers and employers, 
but not only the services, also how they're managed and coordinated, how performance is measured, the, the whole range of things that are important to the services that get delivered, and their effectiveness and their quality. Now, change in industry practices. Uh, these changes focused on a wide range of human resource issues, uh, hiring, retention, uh, worker engagement, skill development, promotions, diversity, supervisory practices, uh, um, recognition of industry-recognized credentials, the, the, the range of things that uh, typically are the responsibility uh, of a human uh, resources uh, officer or that a, a company tries to take care of in that issue in that area if they, they don't have the human resource officer. But, but these changes may also affect other areas, uh, customer relationships, uh, innovation, uh, quality, or productivity, uh, things that are important for a company to get right and to you know, do well, affecting both the, the uh, revenue that they generate, their top line, and also their profits, their, their bottom line. Um, and then policy change. Now, policy change has two different aspects. So one is funding for and uh, policy that affects workforce development. And again, when I say workforce development, it's the whole range, uh, human services and, and uh, post-secondary education and uh, all of the different kinds of workforce development uh, services. Um, these changes uh, address elimination of barriers, uh, but also provision of support for effective practices. And uh, just as one large area that, that uh, we at NNSP are concerned with is uh, support for, for sector initiatives. The other policy uh, arena for systems change uh, has to do with law and regulation regarding an industry. And as I said, especially its human resource practices. But uh, these are changes that both uh, affect incentives, uh, typically public funding uh, that goes to an industry, uh, but also regulations that affect the industry. Let's move on to the next slide. So I'm going to run through a, a few of these slides very quickly just to give you some examples of systems change. Uh, just to say uh, uh, a little bit about this, 80% of sector initiatives pursued change in workforce development systems based on a survey that we did in 2009. Uh, one example is Manufacturing Works. Uh, they brought about the first kind of systems change on this uh, slide, uh, setting criteria to prioritize businesses uh, with good jobs for services. You know, they're a one-stop. Uh, they're in Chicago. They're managed by Instituto del Progreso Latino. Uh, they're part of Chicago's workforce development system funded by WIA funds. They set uh, tiered criteria. So uh, businesses that have good jobs were prioritized for services. And they has, had a second category, uh, one step down, businesses that wanted to uh, work on improving job quality. Um, I'll leave it there instead of going through their whole strategy, but they really made a mark. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So as I said, another area for systems change is industry practices. And uh, you can see over 75% of sector initiatives we surveyed uh, took this one on. Uh, just one organization that did this. Uh, in Philadelphia, AFSME 1199C Training and Upgrading Fund is a labor management partnership. And, um, you know, they worked with businesses, uh, healthcare businesses, to support Frontline worker advancement, that first example on the, on the uh, presentation that you see. Um, they, uh, uh, re the result of it was that they established work-based learning. It led to an industry-recognized certif certificate, and that certificate counts for higher-level college credit. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, in the area of policy, um, just an example, uh, Work System Inc., uh, they're a, a WIB, a Workforce Investment Board in, in Portland, Oregon, and they and other partners uh, began an effort that led to, uh, first at the city level, a community workforce agreement that set up certification for businesses um, that do residential efficiency. It includes commitments regarding job quality, 
and also employment of disadvantaged and non-traditional workers. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, this will be in the presentation, but here's just a little information on the three successes that I just described. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So, you know, sometimes it's uh, when decision makers see the light. Other times it's when they feel the heat, uh, when systems change happens. So I want to spend a little uh, time on what sector initiatives do. And let's go to the next slide. You know, as Scott and Jessica said, uh, systems change starts with a vision. Uh, here are eight things that sector initiatives do to pursue the change that that vision calls for. You know, understanding the system, uh, uh, getting, getting a good sense of the lay of the land, uh, of the way the system works. Um, there are a variety of examples. We heard about research. We heard about becoming a, a player in the system. Um, identifying potential tipping points. You know, we heard about how it really uh, makes a difference when uh, a little bit of work, a relatively little bit of work, uh, can produce a major change. You know, you want to look for that. Uh, focusing on specific change or specific changes and making the case. You know, data-driven analysis is crucial to understanding the causes of problems. And then choosing changes to uh, ameliorate those problems that are compelling, that'll make a major difference. Um, and then um, using those changes, as Jessica described, uh, to strengthen the case or the, the opportunity to make changes that will, will be even larger, make a larger difference. Uh, developing and providing expertise. This is the shed light part. Uh, so documenting effective practices uh, and their impact on, on key stakeholders, stories that illustrate why the change needs to be made, uh, building relationships with decision makers and uh, those who they see as experts and providing technical assistance. But then also, you know, generating the heat. Uh, Jessica talked about the importance of organizing. Um, you know, uh, figuring out who can influence decision makers and, and bringing them together to do it, showing the impact of pilot programs, um, developing advocacy networks, and of course communicating effectively. You know, and this is first of all how you frame your message. It's got to address what society values, it's also got to address the interest of key stakeholders, uh, using not only the media as a microphone but also communicating directly with stakeholders and developing champions and using social media to uh, identify potential sp supporters, communicate with them, and, and involve them. You know, it's a lot to make systems change, but it takes more. Uh, if you want to keep systems change, establishing the infrastructure to implement the change effectively and sustain it. So there's both bringing about institutional change, uh, just uh, the one Scott talked about in the, in the one stop, uh, that are necessary to implement the change uh, effectively. And then also building the commitment among all the stakeholders to maintain influence so the system continues to do what it should. And then of course monitoring the outcomes. So one of the things that can be done to influence systems change is to change the system's feedback loops. For that, in part, you need to design changes in the data that the system provides on outcomes that are important, and then actually monitor that data and give feedback based on it. So Jim, that's a, a, a quick summary of some of the lessons uh, on systems change. Let me leave it there. Well, I think this is actually a, a great place for us to to wrap, and I thought that what I might do is ask Scott and Jessica to just comment on the principles identified here in this slide, and whether uh, they seem to fit, or how they seem to fit the systems change work that they've already described, and whether there's one or two of these items that particularly applies to, to what you've done. Um, Scott, do you want to briefly tackle that and then uh, and let Jessica follow you? 
Sure. I think the one thing that I would add is that, and this is a great list, Jack. I think it's a great summary of, um, of the research and experience of many people around the country. The one other thing I guess that I would add is that um, you have to have a sense of action and moving forward. And there's so many times when you're involved in engaging the system and trying to push for new things to happen that you can develop this inertia. Um, there's nothing more deadly than that happening. And uh, somehow or another, whether that's some kind of a support group that you work with or just a group like NNSP where you have folks who are practitioners who are doing this kind of work, you need to somehow get the um, you need to get the juice to keep going. <laughs> so I would say I would add a an action orientation and you know, willing to keep at it and be persistent. Just in terms of the organizing of this is just so important. And did you particularly look for small attainable wins that could then lead to uh, greater changes down the road as part of your approach? I guess I would like to say uh, that I did, but in reality, when you're out there doing the business, um, you just you go with whatever you have, and you kind of have the vision in mind. And mm -hmm. in retrospect, yes, you see that there's um, you see that tipping points have happened in the midst of it. But sometime mm -hmm. when you're in the heat of battle, um, they don't necessarily come to you. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's more on reflection after the fact that you really you can learn from that if you do that kind of reflection periodically, but it doesn't necessarily happen when you're in the midst of the action step. So from That's your point of view, having an action orientation then leads to the small wins that can contribute to big wins. Uh, yeah, at least in your personally, I've always been ready, fire, aim in terms of my approach. <laughs> okay, it seems we're recommending that. Um, Jessica, what about uh, what, what about you? How do these principles uh, reflect your experience of systems change at at, at Lane in this in the Repower LA project? Are you there, Jessica? Sorry, I had the mute button on. I forgot to oh. take it off. Um, I think what Scott said. I think these. First of all, I think these principles are great, and I think what Scott said about movement and momentum are right on. And I think sometimes we forget to be communicating about the smaller victories because we have the, our eye on something really big. And that was something that I learned. I think I spent time thinking, you know, we've got to win everything. And I forgot, like, you know, we had this incredible community meeting or we had, you know, our first folks were hired. And you just continue to communicate, use email, use videos to continue to, to create this feeling of momentum. Um, and I think that creates a kind of campaign um, uh, sort of environment that people want to suddenly want to be a part of, and then you're you know then you're winning. Okay, great. Well, um, before we before we leave, I want to flag a few upcoming other other webinars from NNSP. Later this week, we're going to have a webinar that in some ways builds upon this webinar in the sense that it's about what sector initiatives can do about employment disparities by race and ethnicity. And a lot of what they can do is programmatically address the issue, but then also uh, in instigate systems change that uh, will uh, create benefits for people of color. So uh, if you haven't already, I hope you'll tune in for that one on Thursday. And um, then in February and April, we have two webinars with nationally recognized workforce development trainer Larry Robin. Uh, and if you haven't heard Larry speak, he's, he's really great. I, uh, I still remember things that he uh, told me in workforce development training 15 years ago. Um, and he's got two webinars on topics that are very nuts and bolts oriented, but for sector initiatives and other workforce development organizations. So um, we'll include links to those in your materials. And as you exit the webinar, I want to thank you for being part of this. And I want to encourage you to give us your feedback. We really take it seriously. This will take about 30 seconds, probably less. But uh, we will use it to improve future webinars beginning on Thursday. And just 
thanks to our fantastic uh, panel, uh, Scott, Jessica, and Jack. Really appreciate your sharing your expertise. And judging from the number of questions that we got, um, people really could have kept uh, hearing from you for, for a good long, while longer. So thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Um, we will uh, follow up this webinar with uh, an email with links to materials and the recording. Um, if you have questions and would like to follow up with us, you can contact me at this address. And uh, thank you again for participating. I hope you have a great rest of your day.